Welcome back to Catholic Courses. I'm your professor for this lecture series on the four last things, Dr. Regis Martin. So what does it mean to think of life as a journey, a journey that eventuates in death? It means that it must first begin before it ends, and that in between there is time, which is the theater or setting in which real choices are made, choices that edge us closer to the light, or God help us, away from the light, out into the darkness that threatens to engulf us forever. In other words, there is a road we must all enter upon at birth, a road along which we must travel in the course of living our life, until finally the road ends with death, followed by judgment and the prospect of an eternity of either heaven or hell, looming in the distance. Three divisions or classifications can be made about this image of life as a road we set upon a journey we are constrained to make. One, that it begins, certainly. There is surely a moment when none of us existed, and then another moment when, bingo, we began to be. However cleverly you may try and disguise the fact, you do exist. You need not be, and yet, triumphantly, defiantly, against all the odds, you are, you exist. So life has a beginning but it also has an end. It will not go on in this present form indefinitely. At some point, the lights will go out and we will thereupon cease to be either in this body or the world's body with all of its weight and extension. The life of this flesh and bone, this veil of tears, will not last forever. That's what the seed of mortality means, that nothing in the plant or the flower can keep the bloom of its beauty forever. Sooner or later, it must wither and die. But between the beginning and the end, between the first and the last moment of life, between these two bookends we call past and future time, there is this pesky little thing we call the present moment, the passing moment. In fact, it is a moment so fleeting, so fugitive, that even as I speak the word, it passes away. It's gone. You cannot retrieve or recover it. Only in Hollywood, of course, which feeds on fantasy, does the thread of the story rewind itself in order to allow the characters the luxury of playing the same scene over and over again with almost infinite variations of outcome. Like that poor fellow in the movie Groundhog Day who is forced to jumpstart the same day over and over again until he gets it right, which sort of trivializes the freedom of the present moment. If life were only one reincarnation after another, what does it finally matter, the choices we make along the way? A captain of industry in one life, a cockroach in the next. Who cares? All right, so life begins and then life ends. Meanwhile, Sandwiched in between, there is the present moment, replete with all the promise and the possibility of human freedom. The terrifying compliment, C.S. Lewis calls it, which is the freedom God extends to us by taking seriously the choices we make. How shall we decide? What use shall we make of our freedom? These are questions that take us by the throat. 
The church, of course, in her wisdom, her experience, has worked it all up into three distinct disciplines, each of which aiming to throw light upon these great and seminal moments of time. Beginning with archaeology, the study of first things, which is the point of origin where everything begins. If life is a river, then there is the source of its movement, its flow, that mysterious flash point when everything begins. And of course, for the Christian, as the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins reminds us, grace rides time like a river. So there is never a moment in the sweep and the movement of time that God, in some sense, has not already penetrated, surrounding and permeating it with his grace. He does hover above the surface, but he also enters deep down into the flux of the river itself. And then there is the other end of the stick, eschatology, which is the study of the end the last things, when the ceiling finally comes crashing through and the life of the world to come may be said to begin in great and cascading earnest, rushing in upon us. And then there is chirology, which is the study of this present moment, what St. Paul calls the kairos which is a wonderful Greek word meaning time, but not the time we set clocks by, which is called chronos, which is mechanical, segmented, and very often boring and oppressive. Kairos is a very different sort of time. It is God's time and therefore free and gracious. Indeed, Kairos is a gift given us to by God in order that we might experience this present passing moment as a means of grace, a sacrament even intended to lead us to the unending glory of the kingdom of God, heaven, the beatific vision, where, as the poet T.S. Eliot reminds us, near the end of his Four Quartets, which is a profound and really quite beautiful meditation on the whole meaning of time and history and of their mysterious intersection with eternity. There at the still point of the turning world, there the blessed soul undergoes a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. And all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well, when the tongues of flame are enfolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. Now there, it seems to me, is a description perfectly applicable to the life of the saint, any saint, capturing the simple transforming union of which, for example, the great mystic Teresa of Avila speaks. The artist Bernini has rendered unforgettably in his sublime depiction of her transverberation, that mystic high point of her life, when repeatedly struck by the lance of divine love, she falls into a swoon of the most pure and profound longing for God.